<clears throat> Let's talk about Cockrows by Ted Hughes for this week's poem of the week. I uh, talked about this in the Substack last week. It is a rare poem about chickens. You don't get poems about hens, you do get them about cockerels. Uh, and I quite like this one. Uh, Ted Hughes is British pro poet laureate uh, up to his death, I think, in fact, uh, from the 80s through to the 90s. Um, I think he may have been the one to succeed when Philip Larkin declined on John Betjeman's death. And uh, yeah, he had a lot of nature poetry in lots of ways throughout his career, lots of different formats of nature poetry, uh, from the kind of mythical cycle of the crow poems to his early stuff like uh, the Thought Fox, very famous poem of his, to his farming and walking around Yorkshire related nature poems, Remains of Elmet, Moortown Diary, things like that. So yeah, I'll, I'll read it and then we'll have a look as we go through. I stood on a dark summit among dark summits, tidal dawn splitting heaven from earth, the oyster opening to taste gold. And I heard the cockcrows kindling in the valley under the mist. They were sleepy, bubbling deep in the valley cauldron. Then one or two tossed clear like soft rockets and sank back again dimming. Then soaring harder, brighter, higher, tearing the mist, Bubble glistenings flung up and bursting to light, brightening the undercloud. The firecrest of the cocks, the sickle shouts. Challenge against challenge, the answer to answer, hooking higher. Clambering up the sky as they melted, hanging smouldering from the night's fringes. Till the whole valley brimmed with cockroaches, a magical soft mixture boiling over. Spilling and sparkling into other valleys. Lobbed up horse shows of glow-swollen metal from sheds in back gardens, hencots, farms, sinking back mistily. Till the last spark died, and embers paled, and the sun climbed into its wet sack for the day's work, while the dark rims hardened over the smoke of towns from holes in earth. So yeah, I, I, it's nice. It is, uh, basically, we've talked about this before, that it is, uh, you know, basically free verse, um, so we can compare it in what we've looked at to uh, certainly the catch, which was last week, Simon Armitage, uh, or, uh, to some degree, the landscapes of T.S. Eliot sometimes are fairly free versy, And, uh, yeah, um, the, the, the thing here is this kind of metaphorical physical imagery, I think, of fire and the cockerels, both their song and, and, the, and kind of metonymously them, the, 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 the cockerels themselves, are, uh, you know, to be seen as fire. And it's a very positive de depiction, isn't it, of the cockerels. It's a very positive natural depiction, rather than a, uh, you know, what you might think from many uh, of this type of modernist, late modernist poet, of a grim, grimy picture of the world. And of course that's limited. We see that in Eliot, you know, famous for the Wasteland and Prufrock and uh, Gerontian, but also uh, magnificent nature imagery uh, elsewhere including the landscapes which we've we've looked at. Uh, but nonetheless, for Ted Hughes of all people, you might think of Crow. Uh, all of the many poems about animal death in Remains of Elmet and Moortown Diary and, and the other 70s and 80s collections. But here, this is a, a, a positive and quite mystical and mythical um, kind of version of the cockerel. Cockerels are not particularly nice animals, I should say. Uh, so here it's dawn, tidal dawn, uh, tidal dawn, which is, uh, you know, the, the, the sky is an oyster. So um, I suppose the sky is this, is this kind of thing where it opens and the sun comes out. It's the, um, to taste gold is the, it's a bit of a mix, mixture of the image there, but you have this quite strong image to start with. And it's an animal image again, you know, the idea of this gigantic oyster from which the sun emerges or which is trying to eat the sun. And I heard the cockroaches kindling in the valley under the mist. They were sleeping, bubbling deep in the valley cauldron. So cauldron, bubbling is water, but cauldron of course is hot. So we, we have the oyster, this water image. We have another water image with bubbling, but then cauldron is hot. It's beginning to come up. And then that idea of heat, the ones who start to clearly crow like soft rockets, which dim. So we've got this kind of fire um, imagery. Um, we, we, we have had a bit of a bit of water, uh, as I say, we'll. Um, uh, yeah, we'll 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 mark that. 
two. That's an awful T. So we've got wafer, water. And then soaring harder. So soaring like the rocket. Harder, brighter, higher, tearing the mist. Bubble glistenings flung up and bursting with light, brightening the undercloud. The fire crests of the cocks. So suddenly the the dawn light hitting the cloud and piercing and thin mist because uh, cockro cockroach is not actually thin mist. Please understand that. That's not science. Um, but there is a sense in which he's see hearing and there's a sort of synesthetic experience of seeing the light come up under the clouds and the mist begin to burn away in the dawn light. You know, a dawn mist tends to actually be a pretty good sign for a good day, um, you know, typically. And uh, it burns away the mist and as he sees it, it's the light is like, reminds him of the, the cock's coat. Um, which, you know, in, on, on cockerels, though not very nice creatures, can be exceptionally handsome creatures. And the, the great cock's comb and glowing, fiery uh, feathers of the common cockerel. And, you know, mo most uh, subspecies with the green and the yellow and the red. Uh, and the red comb and the red wattle. And so he's suddenly the, the kind of light on the, on the clouds becomes the light on, particularly on the, uh, the, the comb of the cock. Um, and it, they're challenging each other. These, it's as if the light is traveling from their mouths with, like their comb hitting and they're challenging each other, hooking high, clambering up the skies as they melted again um, and smoldering. This is also fire imagery. Uh, to the whole valley brimmed with cockroaches, a magical soft mixture boiling over, spilling and sparkling. Lobbed up horse shows. So suddenly, glow swollen metal, the uh, uh, and and sheds in back gardens, Hencott's farm, sinking back mistily. So they 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 are lighting the sky, um, and this is like you know the fact that you see the dawn light hit things for the first time, glow swollen. <clears throat> suddenly the metal seems bigger than itself which is the thing by the way you look at i'm thinking about bare metal uh, as the example here obviously but say cor uh, you know corrugated iron or whatever down at the allotment or in your garden or, um, on the shed or something and as it because of how much it's reflecting um it obviously seems to take up a bigger space and uh, the last spark and ember again fire so and the sun climbs. So you have this, I think, very, very imagistic. Um, it's, uh, we talked about imagism last time. And this is, I think, less imagistic in that technical sense than the catch. It's not the one moment that you're seeing in slow motion. It is this dawn, dawn parade. It is the orchestra. Um, you have a passing of time. Um, but I think it is, it is paint, it's meant to be painterly. It's impressionistic indeed as well because it relies on light. Is playing with images of light um, and you know because in impressionistic painting um, ro you know increasingly instead of hard lines you have color and the color is distinguished by light uh, to mark out areas of of the painting um, and I think you see that here this is definitely if Crow uh, in Hughes's work is often expressionism I would say this is impressionism uh, this is profoundly impressionistic. We do have, uh, if you're on a Hughesian, Hugesian uh, image, the cli sun climbed into its wet sack uh, for the day's work, or the dark rooms hardened. That, that, by the way, another thing, the dark rooms hardened, the fact that the kind of quality of light changes, obviously, and you, you have clearer lines. Strong image there as well. But the sun climbing into its wet sack, I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. Um, other than that, I suppose from this very fiery thing on the horizon is an interesting how, because we don't look directly at the sun partly, the sun in the sky seems less dramatically fiery perhaps sometimes than it does at dawn or at dusk. Because, it, you know, you and particularly at dusk where the quality of the light, as we understand, it's fading. And so when we watch it for 15 minutes, we understand that the nature of the light is changing and ebbing. Um, it, probably there is a, a kind of ancestral memory of uh, of fire embers there uh, whereas in the sky it's just a big light isn't it you know it's hot if it's hot and it's not if it's not uh, but yeah so uh, Hughes gives us a very impressionistic and positive picture and it's also one that's seen it puts the cockerel into almost the picture I don't think there are explicit references here but almost into the picture of a kind of Greek mythical Roman mythical um, Celtic mythical whatever creature by that I mean that it's the fire cock you know you the, the it fires uh, things into the sky to open up the oyster of the uh, horizon to let the sun out or something like that. They, these images are 
are mystical. Um, yeah, I like it a lot, uh, even if it is overly romantic about cockerels. But then that's fine, because you know, nature poetry partly uh, is usually seeking to depict something other than simply the nature it observes. It's usually trying to tell a story about us and about the na order behind nature, things like that. Uh, we go back to early on, we looked at Snowdrop by John Clare, and um, he, though he is trying to tell both sides of the story are snowdrops you know they're very pretty but also they die you know when the weather changes they're quite vulnerable or something at the same time he uh, that's very much put into dramatic and philosophical terms of this is like human interactions so the other thing to discuss or observe is just verse form uh, and things you know the, this is the technical side of it uh, you see by the way there are a moderate number of not super peculiar words there are very few peculiar words there are some which are slangy like lobbed up um or gl bubble glistenings that's neologism obviously there fire crests i guess uh, but mostly these are not uh, lots of new words not lots of neologisms not lots of uh, peculiar words and i'm thinking possibly uh, a good bet for that certainly him to god my god uh, has uh, a lot of uh, pecu you know, potentially peculiar phraseologies and uh, uses of words. I suppose there's not lots of neologisms, which is one of the ways. And the same with Eliot. There are occasionally uh, kind of odd uses of word. Un by odd, I mean unusual uses of word. In cock crows, there aren't many except where they're explicitly metaphorical. What's happening with the cock crow is metaphorical. Um, we're not talking, apart from, as I said, things like bubble glistening. But there are a lot of very vivid words, and the, in contrast to the catch from last week, there are, this, this basically, there are not many vivid words. By vivid, I mean kind of strong, peculiar words, or ones that really kind of stick in the mind as images, compared to, say, landscapes, which has lots, you know, golden head, crimson head between the green tip and the root, uh, lots of phrases which, um, you know, are strong, black wing, brown wing, even though they're not particularly unusual words. The catch didn't have many of those comparatively, backwards, upwards. But Cockrose does, soaring, harder, brighter, higher, tearing the mist. Uh, you know, the, and especially because we understand this is metaphorically being applied to the Cockrow. So it's a very strong image with very strong artistic words. Uh, the, the verse form, as you can see, there's no regular verse form. You get four lines, four lines, two lines, uh, nine lines is that, I think, three lines, three lines, one, two, two. Here we have a very explicit use of the idea of, uh, well, if poetry is a form of punctuation, here we have particularly the idea of, um, uh, we talked about it with another free verse example last week in the catch, of, and though there there were regular verse length, three lines, um, generally speaking, uh, here uh, we have a very obvious use of enjambment, line ending, and verse ending as well, stanza ending, um, to create a pattern of breaths. Uh, there is often a lot of it. I stood on a dark summit among dark summits. You're 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 mapping a pretty normal um, bit of English there. You know, I stood on a dark summit among dark summits. Could be prose. It sounds poetic. I heard the cockroaches kindling in the valley. Yes, you've got an alliteration there. Cock cock crows kindling. Absolutely in the valley which uh, is it, exploiting the soft sounds at the end to contrast with the curse but again it's not poetry on its own but you get this and there's a full stop there so this is sentence starts so we'll start from here and i heard the cock crows kindling in the valley under the mist they were sleepy bubbling deep in the valley cauldron you see how there were being guided to in the valley not in the valley under the mist in the valley under the mist so you've got an emphasis on, you know, one, you get a stress on un, uh, but also you are pulled towards that image of the valleys and the mist, which goes back to that oyster image as well. You, know, you can see the, the picture in your mind more strongly due to that break and the fact that that causes us to read it one way rather than the other. And this continues throughout uh, here. Then one or two toss clears like soft rockets and sank back again dimming. That is a separate moment in image. So a bit like how paragraphs in prose we are often taught are we not that paragraphs each paragraph should have a different subject 
Now, this can actually be quite hard in practice. You know, you, you, maybe you broke too early, maybe you broke too late. It can be a complex task, but we get the principle that a paragraph is a different subject. That is not always true with poetry. A stanza doesn't always mark a completely different subject. Uh, it may well be that you have, and I'm thinking particularly in things like um, where you have rhyme patterns in sextets, say, but it's blank verse, is that you might have multiple sextets that are linked together by the same image or set of thoughts. So it's not, you know, it, there's no break between the stanzas on, on topic. But here he is breaking topic with a stanza, um, or rather, sorry, breaking image. So I stood on a dark summer, I saw the, the dawn, great. And I heard the cock crows bubbling in the cauldron. And then they start flying up. So he's using these, and that of course means he needs to end here and sank back again dimming because that is the end of that first um, volley. Then soaring higher, so there is a time, you know, the point is that this is a time break. And you continue on to the whole valley, this is the later point now, everything has changed, it's gone from being dark to being light. And this is more, uh, so this is that rather than the magical soft mixture, here is the images of things being lit. And then we start slowing down. The fact that these, these stanzas are shorter does not make it quicker but slower. You might think, surely, short stanza, punchy. But of course, actually, because it leads us to break and to breathe, it slows it down. Lobbed up horse shows of glow swollen metal from sheds in back gardens, hencots, farms, sinking back mistily, till the last spark died and embers paled, and the sun climbed into its wet sack for the day's work while the dark rims hardened over the smoke of towns from holes in earth. You're breaking more. Compared to this, this, is, you know, the, uh, this is really the crescendo, you know, uh, whereas down here we have the falling action. We have, uh, I mean, yeah, you know, it, it, it may be credential um, information, <laughs> as it were, but it is the falling action. It is, the resolution is actually quite quiet here. It's coming down. Um, and so he's using the verse form to do that for us. Those are those are my thoughts on Cock Crows by Ted Hughes. Uh, I think it's very nice. Um, <coughs> I think it's interesting ha having done some fairly structured poems in uh, Snowdrop, Him to God, My God, uh, in Going, Going, and the landscape. Some of them have more form than others, and and we've done some. Free, free verse, particularly the catch and cockroaches are very much free verse in a way that uh, Elliot is on the edges for a lot of what he's doing. But we can see the techniques that come up um, and uh, and again, how much artistry there is in it. Uh, I think next week I'll be looking at Gerard Manley Hopkins, so we'll be back in, uh, in more traditional territory. Anyway, you tell me what you think of this one in the comments and I'll see you next time.